I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, Volodymyr Zelensky says he's considering a reset to replace several senior officials amid rumors he plans to fire the head of Ukraine's army. In Russia, Kremlin critic Boris Nadezhin runs into problems with his presidential bid, and our senior foreign correspondent Sofia Yan interviews Latvia's foreign minister as the country boosts its defensive readiness in light of Moscow's aggression in Ukraine. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 5th of February, one year and 345 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols, Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes, and Senior Foreign Correspondent Sophia Yan. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. Let's go back over the weekend. I'm not quite sure when exactly this was published, so I'll just a sort of general over the weekend bit. Geolocated footage shows Russia made marginal gains to the south and the northeast of Avdivka and also to the northwest of Marinka. That is just west of Donetsk City. Ukrainian forces also made, this is geolocated again, also made similar gains, so very small gains, east of Klishchivka. That's about it for movement on the front line. On Saturday, the crew commander of a Russian Tu-95 bomber, Tupolev-95 strategic bomber, was shot in the Russian city of Engels. This is coming from Ukraine's military intelligence. That air base, which is almost 800 k's southeast of Moscow, about 600 k's east of the border with Ukraine, depending on where you take it from, but it's right over by Kazakhstan. It's a long, long way away. That has been used repeatedly to attack Ukraine with aircraft firing cruise missiles. Ukraine's military intelligence agency is still clarifying whether the individual Oleg Stegachev has survived the attack. They didn't claim responsibility for the assassination attempt, but hinted that it was involved. The agency said in a statement, we remind you that retribution awaits all war criminals. We know your names, addresses, car numbers, usual routes and habits. Now then, yesterday, Sunday, President Zelensky visited troops at the southern front line near um, Robotine, that's in Zaporizhia Oblast, and also then visited the Ukrainian Eastern Air Command in Dnipropetrovsk Oblast. Ukraine's Tavris Group of Forces Commander, Brigadier General Alexander Tarnavsky, and also the commander of the Zaporizhia Group of Forces, Brigadier General Volodymyr Horbachuk, um, updated President Zelensky about defensive operations around Avdivka, the situation on the southern front and also other areas to the east. Zelensky also visited the Ukrainian Eastern Air Command. He spoke to a number of electronic warfare teams there, the folk that have been front and centre of repelling Russian drones. He also spoke to them about the use of Western and what's being called hybrid air defence systems or Western Ukrainian air defence systems that are sometimes, you'll hear the phrase Franken-Sam, as in surface wear missiles and Frankenstein. So Franken-Sams, these are modifications of old Soviet kit. So old Soviet air defence launchers generally that are used to fire Western missiles. And they do take a little bit of integration, a little bit of sort of jiggery-pokery to make it work. But generally what we've been seeing is Soviet vintage book air defence vehicle firing American-made Sea Sparrow missiles or other old Soviet vehicles firing American Sidewinder missiles and the firing of... Patriot missiles from various launchers, but apparently being laid onto targets using Soviet radars. So that sort of family, if you like, called called Frank and Sam's. We'll hear more about that, I'm sure. Also on Sunday, so remember the uh, Ivanets uh, guided missile ship that was sunk last week in the Black Sea? First of Feb, it was sunk just off the coast of Crimea. Apparently destroyed using six naval drones. This comes from Ukraine's military intelligence chief, General Kirill Badanov, speaking yesterday. He said the mission was undertaken by one of the special units, Group 13. And, and Group 13, well, on the social media footage that you might have seen online, had the sort of Group 13 motif. But they apparently were using, again, another new term for us all to learn, Maritime Autonomous Guard Unmanned Robotic Apparatuses. 
Magura V5, uh, these new drones being called, multi-purpose naval systems that can be used for surveillance, reconnaissance, obviously two separate things there, maybe we should dig into that sometime, difference between those. They also search for and eliminate mines, as in combat high explosives. So Magura V5, that's the new term for us there. Also yesterday, President Zelensky said he is considering a reset, his word, reset, to replace several senior officials. This is obviously in the context of and the rumours of plans to fire General Valery Zeluzhny. So Zelensky saying it's not just the one individual. When he was asked about um, Zeluzhny, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, speaking to it on an interview, sorry, a broadcast interview yesterday, he said, when I speak of turnover... I have in mind something serious that does not concern a single person, but the direction of the country's leadership. It's a question of the people who are to lead Ukraine. A reset is necessary. I'm talking about a replacement of a number of state leaders, not only in the army sector. Now, responding to that last night, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, he said it's not something the U.S. government should be weighing in on one way or the other. It's the sovereign right of Ukraine and the right of the president of Ukraine to make his personal decisions. So they are staying well out of the way. However, given the freedom of retirement, writing on his blog, retired Australian Major General Mick Ryan, a good chap, we've had him on the pod before, well worth a follow. He said there may be some, particularly in the US Congress, who could exploit a change in the commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian armed forces and any public fallout afterwards as additional evidence for why they shouldn't support further packages of US assistance for Ukraine. Remember that um, Zeluzhny is very popular with the troops and the public at large, thought to be one of the reasons why Zelensky is potentially hesitating against making his decision, which has been pretty widely telegraphed, no pun intended. Now, also on Saturday, Moscow is saying that Ukrainian shelling killed at least 28 people in a bakery in the Russian-occupied city of Lysychansk. That's in the east of the country in Luhansk Oblast. Russian-appointed authorities in the region are saying that a high-ranking minister in the breakaway government, their words, breakaway government, had been killed in the blast. Alexei Potelshenko, who's Moscow-backed emergency situations minister, apparently among the victims there. This is coming from um, Leonid Paschik, speaking on Telegram. Two members of the local parliament were also killed in the blast. That's from TASS, um, citing Luhansk authorities. And the Russian foreign ministry earlier said that Western weapons, potentially high mass, were used in the strike. Although quite how they would know, not sure. Ukrainian officials haven't commented on the incident. Luhansk, you'll remember, one of the four Ukrainian regions allegedly annexed or supposedly annexed by Russia in 2022, along with Donetsk, Hezon and Zaporizhia. Now, Leonid Paschik, who is the Moscow installed official, head of the self-styled Luhansk People's Republic, he said that at least one child was among the dead and 10 others had to be pulled out of the rubble. I'll read you the Kremlin statement. I don't in any way seek to make light of civilian deaths. But I just want to highlight the utter hypocrisy of the Kremlin, if this was indeed a Ukrainian strike, and just show how pathetically the how pathetically earnest they try to be. But I think we can see through their messaging. So Dmitry Peskov, Kremlin spokesman, said, continued strikes on peaceful infrastructure, in this case the bakery, are monstrous terrorist acts. The number of victims speaks to the monstrousness of this terrorist act. Now, just finally, to bring you right up to date today, this morning, Interior Minister Ihor Klemenko, he said attacks this morning, Monday morning, have killed and injured civilians in Herzon. Uh, And also the Security Service of Ukraine, the internal domestic spy agency, if you like, have detained five individuals allegedly spying on the Ukrainian military, passing information to Russia. They put out a press statement in the last couple of hours. According to the SBU, the detained individuals were operating in Odessa, Zaporizhia and Donetsk oblasts, providing information to to target the strikes. Among the suspects was an official from a Donetsk regional council, two other people from Donetsk oblast, including a former head of a municipal enterprise and a Kramatorsk resident. The group also included an engineer at a defence plant in Zaporizhia and an employee of a transport company in Odessa. They said that apparently the SBU thought they were trying to identify large concentrations of personnel 
and military equipment. In a statement, they said they also tried to locate warehouses with ammunition, fuel and lubricants of the defence forces. All these individuals apparently have been acting separately from each other. But it just we've spoken about it many times before. There's a large effort by Russia to find where these the weapons are going, particularly the Western donated weapons going in Ukraine, where they're being warehoused, where they're being trained with, and also the routes in from where they're landing largely in, in Poland, in Rezhov and, and elsewhere, but largely Poland, the routes from there over the border, timings and so on and so forth. We know that the GRU, Russian GRU military intelligence are actively looking for that. Much harder to do in Poland, and we do occasionally hear of and we report spy rings being picked up or people being picked up in Poland and Romania and elsewhere allegedly spying. I think that's the other end of the pipeline of this. But that's you up to date, David. Thank you very much, Dom. Joe Barnes, thank you so much for joining us. What's taken your eye in the political and diplomatic sphere? Hi, folks. Let's go to Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, who has submitted a proposal to extend martial law and general mobilisation for another 90 days. So that so mobile, martial law and general mobilisation started on February 24th, 2022, when Russia invaded. It's basically been extended every three months extension, extended that till May the 14th. And it basically has the new conscription rules in there, lowering the age, I believe, to what's it, 25 or 26. Sorry, off the top of my head, I don't remember. And then let's go to Russia's ambassador to France is set to be summoned to the foreign ministry in Paris over the deaths of two French aid workers last week in a bombardment in Ukraine. So the French volunteer workers had been killed in a Russian drone strike in the southern Ukrainian region of Kherson, and that's from France's foreign minister, Stefan Strajorny, last week. But then back to the ministry. And so the ministry is going to denounce reinforced disinformation targeting France. And that's according to sources speaking to the AFP news agency. And that comes days after defence chiefs flagged a coordinated Russian scheme to spread false information. So tensions have risen between Moscow and Paris in recent days with the Russian government blasting its militarist frenzy in France after it announced new arms deliveries to Ukraine. That's chiefly the uh, artillery howitzers. And Emmanuel Macron is expected to visit Kyiv in the coming weeks, basically to sign off on its long, France's long-term security commitments to Ukraine. Uh, then over to Moscow, where we've had what we can only describe as yet another display of the Kremlin's crackdown on dissenting voices and the subsequent crackdown on foreign journalists attempting to cover that dissent. So at least 20 journalists covering a demonstration by the wives of mobilised Russian soldiers were detained on Saturday near to Moscow's Red Square. So one of the detained journalists from Agents France Press, which is the AFP news agency I was referring to in the previous story, said that there were Russian and foreign reporters uh, that were arrested and they all appeared to be men. They were detained and taken by van to a police station. There's video footage showing what appears to be these reporters wearing yellow press vests being taken to the police vans. The German magazine De Spiegel, who's one of whose journalists was arrested and later released, and that was basically he, what it announced. But yeah, but by all means, it's not a new issue that we're looking at. So our colleague, Evan Gershevich of the Wall Street Journal, has been languishing in a Russian prison on pre-trial detention for a year now. That's after he was arrested on phony espionage charges in March last year. So both charges that he is employed, the Wall Street Journal and the US government have denied. And that um, pre-detention period was extended last month for another two months. So basically, yeah, he's locked away without any real trial until March. We can look back at our own Natalia Vasileva, who was arrested while reporting on an anti-war protest rice at the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, so it's nothing new there. And it's yeah, not great for people trying to cover those events. But yeah, then a little bit about the protests. So for several weeks, the wives and partners of mobilised men have been staging protests outside the Kremlin, demanding that their partners be brought home. The Kremlin has so far allowed the protest to take place despite tight restrictions. It has placed on a protest since the start of the full-scale invasion two years ago. So several dozen women turned up on Saturday at the march, which marked 500 days since a partial mobilisation of young men into the Russian military. The women were wearing white scarves and carrying flowers, which they placed at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Do you remember lots of people who go to visit Putin will go and lay flowers at the same memorial? And uh, the women say that they want the Kremlin to tell them where their husbands are and when they will return from the front. Basically, the movements so far have gone unpunished. More from Russia and its presidential race. So Boris, and excuse my pronunciation, Nadezdan, who is a Russian anti-war presidential candidate, faces disqualification from challenging 
if we can call it that. Vladimir Putin in this year's Russian presidential election. So on Monday, Russia's central election commission said he would not be registered as a candidate. It claimed to have found a 15.4% defect rate in signatures supporting his candidacy. That's according to Nazardan's press service. So apparently people applying to run as Russian president are only allowed a 5% defect rate in signatures. A final decision will be made and announced on Wednesday. And then from our live blog, um, Harriet Barber, who is in the rain state, has wrote, Tucker Carlson, the former Fox News host, said Russia is doing very well during a visit to Moscow, but he remained coy about whether he would get the chance to interview Vladimir Putin. So in a video captured during his visit, Tucker Carlson said he wanted to, I quote, talk to people, look around and see how it's doing. And it's doing very well. When asked if he would interview Putin, he replied, we'll see. So yeah, he apparently flew in via Istanbul and Turkish Airlines over the weekend. And lots of Telegram channels got quite excited by pictures they deemed to think of Tucker Carlson. It does somewhat appear to him. So if we go back to September last year, Tucker Carlson said he had attempted to interview the Russian leader, but that the UK government had blocked that, the US government, sorry, had blocked that move. This is what he told to a Swiss magazine, De Welt Roche. I tried to interview Vladimir Putin and the US government stopped me. And yeah, that's all from me today, David. So let's go then to our final thoughts. Dom Nichols, would you like to go first? Yeah, a couple of things. I'm looking at something that's just coming in, so bear with me. But before I try and juggle that, a note with interest, rai interest. The Kremlin, in the form of Dmitry Peskov, has warned the West that any attempt to use frozen Russian assets as collateral to raise funds for Ukraine. We've talked about this quite a lot recently. There's a it's building ahead of steam, really, this idea about using Russian assets, difficult to sell buildings, yachts and so on, difficult to show beneficial ownership, who actually owns it. And if it's owned by someone who is sanctioned and someone who isn't, a real muddle there to try and actually use that and to sell it and use the funds. But as I said last week, on the back of that report from the House of Lords, I spoke with Lord Peter Ricketts, came out on Friday's podcast. He was saying it's much easier to use the interest from any held, any frozen accounts, because that is just a cash sum. And if it all goes bendy in the future, and let's say the ICJ say you've got to pay it back, it's just money. Easy to do. Not that they probably would. Anyway, so within the context of a head of steam being built up to use some of the frozen Russian assets in one way or another, Dmitry Peskov has said that would be illegal and would undermine the entire global economic system. So I find that I find that really interesting. So he's talking about it being illegal, undermining established global norms. Now, you might think that Dimitri has suddenly had a conversion to sticking up for the rules-based international order. Just, again, as I, a bit like I alluded to earlier in the news, just that the hypocrisy here and just using any argument to try and make the case for them. On the one hand, you are literally undermining the founding bedrock of the international system, which is don't invade sovereign states. And then on the other side, you're complaining about actions that you deem to be illegal and saying it would undermine the entire global economic system. Well, boo-hoo, Dimitri come back when you've got a better answer. Now, I'm going to try and juggle. Let me know if you can't hear me, because I'm going to try and juggle this report that's just come in, or we've just caught, about some movement in the US. So a number of senators have unveiled a compromise bill. This is coming from the Financial Times, I should say. A compromise bill that would renew US aid to Ukraine, linked to tighter immigration rules on the southern border. So trying to get this $61 billion shifted in the Senate. So Chuck Schumer, leader of the majority Democrats in the Senate, released a text on Sunday afternoon, which we've only just seen. And it's going to set up a vote, which could be this week. Now, you, you remember that originally the whole money was supposed to it was supposed to make it easier to go through to link aid for Ukraine to Israel with the southern border it then turns out no 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 completely the opposite that makes it really hard to do so it sounds like they're trying to row back a little bit and we'll put it to a vote this week in order to go through the bill will need the support of 60 out of the 100 senators meaning a significant number of Republicans would have to join with the Democrats to back the legislation. Anyway, and it then I think it then goes to Congress, doesn't it, for final ratification? But it would be a good sign if the Senate could get that through. But I'm trying to read and juggle that at the same time. So apologies if I've missed some of the nuance there. We will allow bigger US brains than mine to pick up on that tomorrow. Thanks, David. Thanks very much, Dom. Joe Barnes.
So last Friday for a string of Sunday Telegraph stories, I spoke with General Martin Harem, who is the commander of Estonia's Defence Force, basically the most senior soldier in Estonia. And we got discussing Eastern European states take a Russian attack on NATO more seriously than some of the other Western allies. So, for instance, Britain, France and Germany. And this is some of the thoughts that he had. So I think the first issue that he addressed in the preparations and actually taking the threat posed by Russia seriously is geographical. And this is what he had to tell me. He said, whatever is scary for me is not scary for the French or the English. He basically said, look, the prospect of a Russian attack on NATO is, and I quote, hard to believe for some allies, despite the mounting warnings from the alliance's most senior figures, such as Admiral Rob Bauer, who is the head of its military committee, who said there could be war within two decades recently. So General Harim basically said, German motivation is definitely different than the Polish or Estonian, basically suggesting that certain countries probably take that preparation more seriously. And obviously, we're going to have Sophia's interview in the full version of the podcast, so that will probably touch on that a little bit more. And then we went and touched on the idea of conscription. So basically, after Admiral Rob Bauer's warning, General Sir Patrick Sanders, the chief of the General Staff, so the head of the UK Armed Forces, basically said that Britain should be prepared to train citizens for a future conflict. And this was basically ruled out by the UK government. So General Harim basically said that this also is down to ge- geographical distance from Russia, and that plays a part in the attitude. And he said, look, that is why it's very hard to motivate their Western European populations to join any kind of volunteer military movement ready to defend the country, he added. He Then he went on, I would definitely suggest for all countries to establish some kind of conscript type citizen service. He said that could first be based on volunteers, such as the signing of a one-year contract, which includes the training, and then, say, six months or so of service, and then before sending them to a reserve. And that's how he said how you build up a reserve. And then I guess this is also a geographical issue that's coming up and probably a more of a personal reflection. Is the West more inclined to ignore the threat of Russia because it has not lived under direct Soviet rule? And General Harim seemed to agree with this. And he said, look, I have been once occupied. I grew up under occupation and I don't want to be back there anymore. So I think that just gives a feeling of sort of some of the military leaders in in that region when they're being held for level of preparations for a potential Russian ground attack or a Russian attack of some sort, while maybe the likes of Germany, Britain and France are sitting on their hands a bit more. And I will stop there. Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you so much, Dom and Joe. Now, to end today's episode, I hand over to my colleague, senior foreign correspondent Sophia Yan, who interviewed the foreign minister of Latvia, Krishanis Karinj. Here's their conversation. I'm really interested in your thoughts about the preparation and deterrence when it comes to Russia, to Belarus. So I was actually wondering if we could start with this agreement that was signed here amongst Baltic nations not that long ago, about a week or two ago, this common defense line. What exactly will this look like and in what way will this support and enhance this border wall that Latvia has already been building? Currently, we have a border defense that is a deterrent to illegal migration. It's not a military structure. It is a civilian infrastructure. We have, for more than two years, a continual hybrid attack from Belarus, where the Belarusian government has been organizing third country nationals to enter Belarus with the purpose of trying to help them illegally cross into the European Union. The goal for these people who are from many parts of the world is apparently not Latvia or Lithuania or Estonia, but Germany, Sweden, Denmark, and Netherlands, the more wealthy nations. And we have kept a very strong border security regime for all of this time. Mm. And this sort of regime is also being extended up through the Latvian-Russian border. What the military people are speaking about now are some additional military type of fortifications, prepositioning. I am not that familiar yet with the exact plans. My understanding is that it's in the process of being worked out. So the Baltics and Latvia's main line of defense is, of course, first and foremost, ourselves. We invest in our military. We are at 2.4% of GDP this year. We are aiming to go to about 3% over the next two or three years. We will hit that target. We have reintroduced the draft, so we're using that to increase the size of our active and ready reserve. 
We have a professional army as the core. We have a quite large national guard, which is voluntary. People come because they're motivated to come. For example, my colleague is a member of the national guard and mm. spends weekends training and doing all kinds of things that he's apparently not even free to speak with me about, I guess. <laughs> That's good. And then we have the obligatory service who train for 11 months. They become enmeshed in the professional units. They learn the skills. They're fully equipped and they go into civilian life, but they can be called up. And with every six months, you know what, we have two call-ups a year. And so on this rotational basis, every year we'll have more and more active reservists. Then we're bu buying new defensive equipment. So we're purchasing together with the Estonians air defense systems, the German Iris T. With the Americans, we're purchasing coastal defense, so anti-ship missile defense. And from the Americans, also the HIMARS, the far-ranging rocket artillery, guided artillery. So we are adding completely new capabilities to our forces. We're investing it. And with that comes the secondary layer of our NATO partners. So we have the NATO EFP headed by Canada which has made the commitment also in the financial commit to build it up at the battalion to a brigade uh, level. We have 10 other NATO members under the Canadian EFP. The next two largest are the Spanish and the Italian contingents who are also investing. We have Danes who are outside of that. We have Sweden who has already pledged that they will join this with a full battalion. So somewhere around 800 soldiers as soon as they are in NATO. So the basis is ourselves. Then comes the NATO commitment. And last summer in Vilnius, we adopted the NATO defense plans that cover all of NATO territory, especially the eastern flank. So when the military is speaking of some sort of a, of a defensive line in the east, this is all part of the broader plans. So it, no one is doing anything on their own. Everything is being done in close coordination with. But NATO defense starts with each individual member state themselves, and then together in the larger structures. So in that sense, actually, ironically, since the start of Russia's war in Ukraine, NATO has a new lease on life. And our country's actual security is larger today than it was five years ago. And that's the ironic effect of aggression. And in terms of what we need to do as NATO in the future, we need to continue in the direction that we're going. So all of us are now helping Ukraine. We're sending them from our stockpiles, munitions, howitzers, radar, everything we've sent them, helicopters, what we have in our arsenals, and we're in the process of replenishing them. So we will have to make sure our military industry increases its production to, first of all, that we can help to continue support Ukraine we don't know how long it will take, but we're going to support them until they succeed and have a victory. But we need to also, of course, have our own stockpiles replenished. And the way to deter Russia, because imagine a positive outcome of the Ukrainian war. All the Ukrainian territory is liberated and the war ends. But on that day, Russia still remains a threat. It has an armaments program, a rearming program that is in full steam. They are on a clear war footing in terms of their industry. And uh, there is no indication that even if they were to lose this war, that they would become less aggressive or less of a threat. And in order to make sure that war in Europe doesn't repeat itself now from Russia's side, we need to be in such a state of preparedness that the Russian generals and the Russian political classes clearly see the direction of Europe is a no-go. Not because Russian individuals like or don't like Europe, but because European defenses are completely up to snuff and uh, that it's not possible to have any gains without tremendous loss and to make sure actually that no gains would be feasible. And that's the goal. And that is absolutely doable. The key is understanding and accepting that what we are doing now is not only a short-term solution. And I think that in order to start adjusting the thinking, we need to think in terms of the next 20 years. So 20 years, that's five political cycles in most countries. That's a very long time. 
and it's not just the government and the parliaments of today, but that we need to set ourselves on a trajectory, a sustainable trajectory, where we can continue to develop as, shall we say, freedom-loving democracies, trading, that we spend our days thinking about, do we need to regulate business more, or maybe we should start to regulate it less in order to get prosperity to grow, but not be worried about the military threat from Russia, but not being worried because we're fully prepared. Right. In terms of shoring up this defense along the Russia-Belarus border, is there any discussion of joint military patrol in, in this ongoing? No, we have not. Between uh, the Baltic states. <laughs> but between the Baltic states, we have agreements on the freedom of military movement if there's a need. We did have a point earlier this year where there was a notable larger influx and our Lithuanian and Estonian neighbors offered assistance and they sent border guards that helped patrol. So we all are prepared on a needs basis to assist one another. But currently the military is not patrolling the border. The border patrol is patrolling the border. But in our country, we already have adopted rules and procedures that based upon the situation, shall we say the threat, the actual threat, there is an algorithm that involves not only the border patrol, but the state police and the military. If this happens, then we react this way. And the key is that the government does not have to hold a cabinet meeting and parliament does not have to decide anything. So if during this interview, a thousand people were to show up on the border, there already would have been a response and as a minister, I would simply be informed of what we're doing. We would not have to decide, should we do something? It's already been anticipated. That is, the algorithms anticipate. And I remember when we first started having the border problems, when Belarus started this, I was a prime minister then, and with the Lithuanian and with the Polish prime minister, we were on a constant contact basis. We all have these phones in our pockets and there are all kinds of applications where you create groups and this is also what politicians do. So as I have very close contact with my colleagues, I had them then as prime minister, I have the contacts now as a foreign minister and of course my, the new prime minister has the, the contacts. Um, we are always speaking with one another. And for example, when the border problems began in Finland, we were already speaking with one another and our border patrol has extremely good exchange of information mechanisms in place that we see what's happening in Poland the Poles see what's happening here and there is an exchange of information we have observed groups that started in one place then came to another place and there's actually a very good cross country border situational awareness there's a lot of discussion about the threat and the risk of Russian aggression, but what about Belarus? Can you talk to me about what sort of threats Latvia sees from Belarus? Are they different from Russia? How do you work in a preventive capacity to handle that specific unique challenge? In our view, it's the same threat and the same challenge. Unfortunately, in our analysis, Belarus seems to have lost most semblances of independence. Now, the Belarusian population we see as being quite different from the Russian population. If the Russian population has a clear support for the war in Ukraine, we do not see this from the information which we're able to get out of Belarus, that this is necessarily shared by the Belarusian population. The Belarusian population, they had their own kind of Maidan. That was the last presidential election. It seems from all the evidence that Tsikhanovskaya won by a very wide margin. And then when the Belarusian regime cracked down She's in exile. She was a candidate. Her husband was put in jail. And uh, she wasn't even the politician, and people still voted for her. That shows how much it seems the Belarusian people did not want the continuation of the dictatorship under Lukashenko. But Lukashenko reacted in the way that he completely consolidated power, stopped any civil society of political discourse. But in terms of a potential threat, it's the same Russian threat if we speak militarily. But if we speak of the societal sentiment, we sense and understand actually a quite different society in Belarus, which in spirit is much, much closer to the Ukrainians or the Lithuanians than, than actually to Russia. 
You mentioned earlier about the replenishing of stock for Latvia itself and also to be able to support the current efforts in Ukraine. What's the timeline for both domestic production to replenish stocks and then also a timeline for being able to procure all these foreign systems that you mentioned? Well, no, everything is in process. So we're continually piece by piece replenishing as we are continually piece by piece helping to resupply Ukraine. And I have spoken with military experts all around and the necessarily timeline that is talked about is gauged against Russia's estimated timeline. When could they rebuild their army to say pre-invasion levels? But I don't want to repeat one of the dates or speculate on a different date because they're being kind of thrown around rather loosely. Politically speaking, we are front-loading monies to purchase equipment today. There is a certain bottleneck at military equipment and ammunition manufacturing. That's being addressed in, it seems, in all countries that have military industry. In our own country, our military industry is also growing. When I became prime minister in 2019, most of our military industry consisted of clothing and gear. And now there's ammunition production, there are already two companies making drones. There are other investments which are now coming. The government has created, in a sense, a large holding company to assist also with funding for maybe smaller companies to gear up and tool up faster. There's a challenge because banks generally don't like to fund companies that that deal in weapons, that is death and destruction. But there is a clear need for weapons and we see with Russia unfortunately the only language that the current government understands is one of strength they don't appreciate negotiation that's a sign of weakness and we can see what kinds of heinous crimes they're capable of in Ukraine we have to assume that's not limited to Ukraine that is simply what they are so we need the arms so we're also doing from our government's point of view what we can and the key is front-loading money. Our military changed its plan of procurement, say from a 20-year timeline down to a five-year timeline. So purchases which were scheduled over 20 years were reduced because we front-loaded money that, that would have been, say, in, in a different circumstances, non-war circumstances spread over 20 years, and we did that a few years ago now. Mm-hmm. How would you characterize the level of risk of Russian aggression toward Latvia, toward its Baltic neighbors? And what's the chance that you think they would do something like what they did in Ukraine to Latvia? Right now, I don't see any direct military threat to any NATO country. And there are many arguments that would say that is very difficult to imagine a scenario. But what we're arguing is that just because it's difficult to imagine doesn't mean it couldn't be attempted. And therefore, we simply must be prepared. So we're not working from, shall we say, an immediate fear, but a very profound realization that it's what it is. You know, it's a little bit like building a house. If you're building a house on a Greek island, you'll have one set of circumstances. You want to make sure you have some shade, big windows, lots of air movement. If you're building a house in Latvia, You'll want to make sure that your house is well insulated, you have a good source of heat, that you have a roof that will withhold a meter of snow if needed, and also in the summer when it gets warm that you you won't overheat. So in different parts of the world, doing the same thing, you have different requirements. Well, NATO living next to Russia, we simply have to do things differently than if we weren't living next to Russia. And, you know, Latvia has always been next to Russia. Russia has, shall we say, in its history, been more aggressive and less aggressive at various times. It has never been a a democratic country, and it still has, and this is what's troubling, but we have to accept that, a profoundly deep ideology of imperialism. So... Many countries around Europe, I suggest that's generally speaking, that used to be empires have changed over time. So the British Empire, okay, we have the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth gains. 
in cricket. But that empire and Great Britain's role, it's completely different. There are now many independent countries. With the monarch, there's a certain symbolic tie that remains. But practically speaking, there is no empire. The Austro-Hungarian empire is no more. The German empire is no more. Under a couple of Napoleon's press was in the business as well. And of course, that all often dealt with colonialism and, and all of the effects that has had around the world. All of that around the world has mostly changed. As nation states have developed, as we live under the rule of law, the United Nations, where a rules-based system based upon the right of self-determination was really catching ground. But Russia has never accepted that. It had an empire called the Soviet Union. That empire collapsed. But in its current view, that was simply a time of Russian weakness, not of Russian profound change. And now they're back in the business of trying to regain a lost empire. And it's simply the facts. And when you look at what Putin has said publicly from the 1920s, he's a Russian, actually a fascist ideologue called Ilian, who was exiled, if I'm not mistaken, to Switzerland, who was maybe obscure at the time. He's dredged up actually just purely fascist arguments of how to make Russia great. And that is through eating up that which is theirs. And to Democrats and democracies, it's strange to think that actually anyone still buys into that. But they do. And we've all been taught and grown up when we have a system where, you know, private property and the right of a country to exist and the non-right of your neighbor to intervene is a given. And then we have police forces and we have military forces and we have the United Nations that upholds that system. And Russia is simply trying to overturn it. In a way, it's a throwback. But just because it's a throwback doesn't mean it's not a very real threat. It is. And what we see, what the Russian military is capable of, is having a complete disregard for human life, also their own soldiers. So they're sending in, and we, we see this from the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians, one of their biggest problems on the front line is having enough ammunition to shoot down the wave after wave after wave of maybe not so well trained. And from a human point of view, it's an absolute tragedy what the government and the military is doing. But puzzlingly, society supports this and does not say, no, this is wrong. And this is how ideology in that part of the world has never stopped working. I cannot imagine under what circumstances in Latvia or in Great Britain or in France, any leader could say, let's all sacrifice ourselves. Okay, there's every, on another sense, a certain amount of self-sacrifice. Yeah, you work a little longer at work or you do something patriotic for your country. But to do this with the goal of overrunning your neighbor. In Europe, we think, well, why would you need to overrun your neighbor? Just go there, have a great cup of coffee, enjoy the show and come home. You don't have to attack anyone to enjoy. But Russia is doing that and they're trying to wipe out Ukrainian statehood and they won't stop of their own accord. They can only be stopped. They need to run up against the brick wall and that brick wall needs to be NATO resolve and proven capabilities. I was wondering, from your perspective, what other support Latvia would like to see from like-minded countries and partners that, like the US and UK, and other, what other ways can they support Latvia? I was thinking when you said support, actually all of my thought of support goes towards Ukraine right now. In terms of what our NATO partners are doing in Latvia, I can only be happy and proud all of our partners are doing their part as we are doing our part. And we have participated, we have sent contingents to Afghanistan and Iraq. When our friends and partners asked for our assistance, we didn't hesitate. And now we've had to ask for their assistance. Well, it's a collective decision, but no one is hesitating there. So within NATO, everything is working. We have the plans now. It's two processes. One is making sure we have all of the assets in place that we can implement them. And the second is rehearsing. And this is what NATO is now doing. Currently, the largest ever joint exercise is underway. I think a total of some 90,000 uh, uh, troops will be involved over a course of time. And this is what the military does. It, it plans what it will do. 
and then it exercises doing that so that if that ever comes into play, the military is in much better shape. And from each exercise, you learn what the shortcomings of, you maybe readjust your capabilities or maybe you readjust your plan. But that's an ongoing process. What we need in the immediate term is increased support for Ukraine. And our argument is our society, which is not the wealthiest society in Europe, we're not a poor country, but we're certainly not the wealthiest, has in mostly military, but also non-military aid, donated about 1% of our GDP. Now, if in NATO, everyone donated, say, a half percentage of GDP, most of Ukraine's military needs would be very well satisfied. So in terms of, can we do it? Of course we can do it. And what we need to come around is that we have to do it. And we have to do this, not only for Ukraine and the Ukrainians, but also in self-interest. Because if Russia succeeds in Ukraine, then Russia will have learned the lesson. Might makes right, and they will look to exercise that might further. And then to stop them later cost more money and potentially NATO soldier lives. And this is a situation we never want to come to. So it's cheaper and much more clever to support Ukraine as we shore up our own defenses, help Ukraine win the war, help Ukraine integrate into the EU and into NATO. As we've all said, Ukraine's future will be in NATO. Ukraine belongs in NATO. Well, when the war ends, that's when that process can begin. And this is what we need to focus on. But we need to focus right now on making sure that Russia does not win, that Ukraine would win. I just want to understand what the discussion is like for Latvia for trying to decide between the short-term priority, which is right now to support Ukraine, but then what you talk about, the long-term defense plan, the preventive capability. I mean, how do you make the decision as to how to allocate your resources and what to do first? Because these are, I mean, it sounds to me that they have been parallel processes. But they're not contradictory processes. We are training our own soldiers. We're also training this year, the goal was at least 3,000 Ukrainian soldiers. So we are, end up will be training more Ukrainian soldiers than our own. And we want to train more. The bottleneck is having enough trained instructors. You can train a soldier in 11 months, but it takes a little longer to have an instructor. So this year we have more instructors than we had last year, and next year we'll have more instructors than we have this year. So it's a parallel process. They're not contradictory because our instructors also learn from the Ukrainian soldiers that, how should we say, no one has direct fighting experience with the current Russian army other than the Ukrainians. That's point one. And point two, in terms of military pro procurement, we have sent a meaningful amount of our arsenal to Ukraine. It's an ongoing process of replenishing that, but also of looking what else we can send to Ukraine. So you could say it's a continual cycle, and they're not at all contradictory to one another. In terms of our air power, we do not have our own fighter jets. None of the three Baltic countries have our own fighter jets. We currently rely on NATO air policing since 2014. But we do have helicopters. And our helicopters were Soviet-made, actually Ukrainian-made. And we have now sent all of our helicopters to Ukraine and we refurbished them, even painted them in Ukraine's military colors so that they would have equipment that works the minute it is there. And we're replenishing with now Blackhawk helicopters. So we have kit, which the Ukrainians know very well how to use. They built them, which they are using as we're getting new helicopters for ourselves. And the aid that has been going to, to Ukraine, the first stocks that went out were all of the stocks that, from the east of Europe that were the Soviet standard or the Soviet made, because that's what the Ukrainians know and have spare parts for and everything else. The pilots have been trained, for example, with the aircraft and helicopters. And what will come in the future, Ukraine's army, it's also in the process of modernizing or NATOizing. I don't want to imply that something is archaic, it's NATOizing, that they are now 
learning to use very many different systems at the same time. It's a versatility that the Ukrainians have that no NATO individual army has, right? So the Latvian forces say that the men and women who are trained on our howitzers are all trained on the same howitzers with the same munition. Ukrainian soldiers who are trained on howitzers, one unit is trained with the ones that we use, another with German howitzers, another with the French, and they are able within one army to maintain expertise in basically all of the weapon systems that NATO has. And now their pilots are being trained on F-16s, countries have pledged. Once that training ends, and of course that has a lot to also do with ground support, you don't just fly a plane, you have to make sure you know, that you can keep it working. And they will have a new level of capability. In terms of their missiles and their long range fires, we all remember that there was lots of hesitation from a number of the countries that had such missiles. That hesitation has, in many cases, gone away. In a couple of cases, it's still there. And we're all the time encouraging our air defense capabilities at the start of the war were Stinger man held anti aircraft missiles. We gave one batch, we gave another batch. Now we have given all of our Stinger missiles to Ukraine. And of course, we are replenishing with other systems and now also buying the new Iris T, much larger, much more capable systems. But those Stingers are very useful today for the Ukrainian army. And they are using in Ukraine Patriot systems, NASAM systems, Iris T systems the German Gepard anti-aircraft. There are lots of systems that are very modern that they're using. We have um, a, a NASAMS air defense within the NATO EFP in Latvia uh, currently, and that will be replaced by our own Iris T uh, when the production is level. So it, it may sound like, well, you have limited forces, you can only do so much. True. But in our thinking, political and military, they're all intertwined. So it's, we will continue supporting Ukraine, and we will continue to replenish and rebuild our own stockpiles. The faster the military industry ramps up in Europe, yeah. uh, or within NATO, the easier it will be for everyone. One really good question is, if you've seen any difference in terms of the number of migrants trying to cross on your border since the war began? I know that the issue that was from a few years back had a lot um, to Belarus, but well, there are many people well, we, We've had various waves, mm -hmm. but since the start of the new year, we've had a couple of weeks with no attempts. And this is something new. It could have something to do with the weather. We had a nice cold minus 25 degrees. <laughs> that may have something to do with it. There could be many other reasons as our problems diminish. Finland started to have problems. So how related this is or isn't is difficult to say. I'm looking at the numbers every day. I haven't looked yet at the numbers for yesterday. But our awareness and preparedness is all the time there. And the algorithm is, I mean, just to explain it is very simple. More of a problem, more forces. Less of a problem, less forces. But everyone is in continual readiness to uh, move. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. 
Ukraine The Latest was produced by Rachel Porter. And the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.